Hello everyone and welcome to our panel discussion on the future of agritech in the Middle East and North Africa. My name is Triska Hamid, I am the editor at WAMDA and we hope today with our panel of esteemed guests to have a fruitful discussion on the future of agritech. For those of you familiar with the history of the Middle East, you will know that it was in this part of the world where agriculture and farming first emerged. Our ancestors were already harvesting crops by 7,000 BC and for millennia afterwards, they innovated and developed new farming techniques. But much like our golden era of science and philosophy, it is a history that is well past us. Today, the Middle East relies heavily on international markets for its staple food products as arable land and water become ever scarcer resources. In fact, in some countries in the GCC, more than 90% of the food is imported and here in the UAE, Government statistics show that the country consumes more than 80% of its freshwater resources to produce less than 15, that's one five percent of its food supply. The issue of food security is one that plagues many countries around the world and several are using technology to address this challenge. Now, firstly, we'd like to get an overview of what's happening in the world. Um, and I'd like to invite Yasin Abu Dawood who is the uh, Chief Development Officer at Brink IoT Accelerator. Uh, Dawood, if you could join us and open your mic and... Okay, it's not letting me uh, open my video. Maybe you can help me with that. There we go. I can uh -huh. start my video. Thank you, Triska, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and, and, and to have these great discussions as it pertains to us in the Middle East, uh, maybe more than other areas. Um, but it's a, it's a very hot topic, obviously, you know, even with the whole pandemic and what's happened over the last, you know, six and nine months. Um, where do you want to start? So I, firstly, I'd like to give some stats over what's happening in, in the region. So we had a look at the investments that have been made so far. And since 2014, we found that there have been 33 investment rounds in agri-tech startups across MENA. Pure Harvest, um, and I'm happy to say Sky is, is on this call, uh, is the best funded startup in the region. They've raised $138 million. Um, Sky can elaborate a bit more on that. I think 100 million of that is still committed. Um, all in all, $250 million has been uh, invested in Agritech, um, and this is the disclosed amount. That's something I've got to stress. Uh, if we take into consideration the amount that wasn't disclosed, that would reach at least 300 million. So by 2050, there will be 10 billion mouths to feed on this earth. And like I said, the GCC imports so much of its food. And that's reflective in, in where these investments have been made. Dubai and Abu Dhabi really lead in, in terms of the, where these investments are going, uh, followed by Egypt and um, Saudi Arabia. Um, and the number of uh, investments is also steadily rising. Last year there were eight, so far this year there have been eight investments made as well. So Yasin, do these numbers um, surprise you or do you think that these uh, the region is lagging behind where others are concerned? Well, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's two parts to it. I mean, there's the part of the investment side and maybe the part also of, of, of how much knowledge base we have in the entrepreneurship side. Um, I think everyone's racing into this uh, category right now. Uh, we predominantly started as an IoT and hardware accelerator. Uh, we've now positioned ourselves as an impact accelerator with one of our verticals being food. And most of our LPs and most of our investors now, I would say have probably transitioned 30 to 40% of their portfolio and their investment into food. Um, just because they see it as probably one of the biggest problems right now um, and that's happening for us predominantly, I would say, in Asia. Um, maybe someone who's not on that list, uh, because I, I don't think they expose as much information as they want to, it's probably China. Uh, China is doing a lot of work in the genome area, in the area of, uh, you know, alternative proteins. You know, they have a huge population to feed. Um, and, you know, the, the, the traditional agricultural way is, is not that easy, especially as their population grows. Um, and Singapore is actually one of the pioneers also, I would say, not just on the investment side, but also on the innovation side. Um, so do the numbers make, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. The numbers are. So the numbers do make sense. I think that um, here, 
you'd probably see a lot of the investment being done. I mean, I know the folks from Pure Harvest are here and they've come to set up here too, but most of the investments they're doing are probably not in this region uh, in terms of, you know, trying to solve the problem. I think it's more of a, of a return approach rather than solving our own problem approach. Okay. And in terms of the, the kind of trends that you're seeing and the innovations that are happening, uh, I mean, you, you have a presence in Singapore and Sydney and in China. Um, what's happening around the world and how does that compare to the innovation that we're seeing in the Middle East? Well, I think right now what, what we're seeing a lot from is the use of bioreactors and the use of technology where we're taking nutrients uh, sorry, where we're taking, you know, um, uh, DNA samples or blood samples from an animal or whatever it is and injecting it with nutrients and, you know, growing chicken, growing beef. Um, this is where I see is the real innovation. Uh, you know, we, we, we invested in one company now who's trying to create uh, breast milk from a mother that can be, you know, created through bioreactors. I think that once that platform is there, um, we're going to see a lot more of that alternative protein because, I think the way that we're producing protein today, um, you know, globally, ev everywhere, whether it's chicken, beef, whatever it is, I think that's the number one thing that's not sustainable and that needs to be addressed. Um, so we've done also a lot of investments in that right now. Um, now that doesn't come without challenges. I, I think when you tell someone that, you know, you're, you're going to be eating, you know, a, a chicken breast out of a Petri dish, um, people are not, you know, so, you know, they're not running to the, you know, to the grocery store to, to buy this stuff. But you've done that, right? You have eaten chicken that's come out of a Petri dish. Yes, uh, I've eaten chicken. I've, uh, I've tried one of the prototypes from Just Foods. They're, 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 they're one of our partners in, uh, in Hong Kong for our food program. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, it tastes like chicken. Um, another very big challenge, though, also is, is, is the price. I mean, you know, the price of one chicken nugget is about almost close to about 80 to to $100. So it, it's obviously not sustainable, you know, in that sense, too. But I think as mass production comes on, uh, I mean, we, we were having the same conversation about Beyond Meat and the Impossible Burger probably, you know, four to five years ago by saying, you know, cost you know, $8, $10 for a burger. Well, now it's, 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 it's almost that part. Specific to the agri-tech uh, ecosystem in the region. Um, I mean, how far away are we from getting to that stage where we're creating you know, biotech and petri dish meat? Well, I think in terms of the actual knowledge base of the region, we, we have a long way to go. What I think is interesting when you mention those investments from the UAE and Saudi and, and, and you know all those countries, I think what they're doing is, which is very smart is saying, well, we're happy to invest, you know, in your business, but we'd like you to have a presence in the region. So there's a lot of cross-pollination by saying you can come to the region, we want to give you access to the market, but you need to set up here, you need to help us push our R&D stronger, push our, our, our IP stronger. And I think what's interesting, especially on the agri-tech side, a lot of the GCC countries, you know, they've, they've solved the problem in terms of arable land by looking at Sudan, where they've purchased, you know, lots and lots and lots of land where they can hopefully deploy some of these uh, technologies through agri-tech, drone technology, you know, to start securing food for their own nations. And they're not going to be able to do it with the kind of knowledge base that we have now. They're, they're, they're going to have to, you know, bring in more folks from abroad, uh, have them set up here, say, you know, we're happy to give you access to our distribution, happy to have you set up here, and happy to give you funding. Uh, and the UAE is definitely one of those cases. And I probably say Saudi is, is, is also very, very, uh, you know, gung ho on that, especially um, with the city of Neom coming up there, you know, they're, they're moving very strong into food and uh, agri-tech. Okay. All right, Yassine, thank you very much for that overview. To further discuss the, the Middle East uh, in detail, we have um, Salvatore Lavallo, who's the acting head of FDI at the Abu Dhabi Investment Office, that's Adio, Miguel Angel Covidano, the chief commercial officer of Merger del Fulton Retail. These are the guys that run Carrefour. Um, Omar El Jundi, who's the CEO and founder of Badia Farms, and Sky Kurtz, the CEO and founder of Pure Harvest. Uh, gentlemen, if you could all switch on your cameras, please, and unmute. Sky, I'd, I'd like to start with you. You are the best funded startup, agri-tech startup in, in the Middle East. Um, but it took a while to get there. What was it like trying to raise investment and, and going to investors here saying you have an agri-tech startup? Uh, in all honesty, it was brutal uh, in, in the beginning, right? Especially when we started this nearly four years ago, 
Uh, it was not as hot a sector and, and less proven than even today. Uh, it's still a relatively new industry, right, in controlled environment agriculture in the various forms. But also, we were Middle East asset intensive ag tech onshore, right, infrastructure investment in a traditionally unsexy sector, right, which was subsidized food. And uh, that was very, very hard. Uh, but ultimately, I, I kind of traveled around the world and convinced people to back us which what, with what was then the largest ever seed financing, about $5.8 million of equity capital, but really on nothing but a PowerPoint, you know, a pile of dirt and the promise of what was possible if we ever secured the capital. And, uh, and here we are today, right? We, we built that farm had, had great success. We've operated three summers now and, and two in two and a half growing seasons. And the, the you know, proof is in the metrics. We've had an incredible production and now we've been able to raise a lot of capital against that to expand. So we're excited about the future, but it was really hard. I mean, when, when did you feel the tide turn? When did people start taking you seriously and then realizing that this is worth investing in? Uh, you know, in all honesty, we had to secure a lead investor out of the United States first. When somebody, when credible money backed us from the U.S., we were able to secure other money around that. In the region, it was extremely difficult. We talked to, we knocked on almost every door, but really it was pretty unproven, right? We were the first market entrant at that time looking for significant amounts of capital. And so it was really hard. Uh, but we ended up raising from the United States, Singapore, Hong Kong, and then, of course, in the region, Saudi and UAE. Uh, to build that, that, that syndicate that invested in that first round. But to give you a sense of how many, we had 31 investors in that round. I mean, you can imagine how many hundreds of conversations and how many no's and then ultimately how many yeses and then closing all those people. So that is extremely atypical for a seed round of a company, right? They usually have a handful of people or, or even led by one. So if it evidences how hard it was. But I would, the capital markets for startups in the Middle East are relatively nascent in general, and they're heavily focused on two things, right? Internet startups and e-commerce. Mm -hmm. And that's almost 95% of the money. Don't quote me, you know better than me, but it's a lot of it. Now that's because it's a young ecosystem. But as we have exits like Kareem and successes like Souk and all of the people that have followed a, and, and ahead of us that have opened the market to where it is for us today, uh, it's progressing. But we need successes not only in our vertical, but in hardware, right? In companies that are IoT. And we're one of the first. So we need to go build this. And if we succeed, investors will follow. Okay. Oh, Amaro, was that your experience as well? Did you have difficulty in, in convincing investors? You're on mute. Hang on. So our 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 our, our uh, you know uh, uh, you know a seed round was actually from uh, from uh, family members, uh, and and that was because we just wanted to prove that this thing has has legs. You know, this is a new industry in the region. We know the technology is there, but no one has done it in the past. And we wanted our subs as well, so we did the designs, the grow models brought in different uh, devices and technologies and put them together. You know, we wanted to build that know-how for ourselves, which is really lacking in the region. Now we're going out and looking to raise, uh, you know, uh, I'll say Series A, but exactly as Sky was mentioning, they're looking, they're, they're focused on e-commerce. This is, you know, you're trying to show them the numbers. They're looking for that J-curve. So it's it's been a struggle. We, we have a good list of uh, investors, but I mean, it's still really, it's very early stage. So I've, I think we've got one part is the investors. Another part is the infrastructure isn't there as well. You know what I mean? So their government, there's a lot that needs to be done. We are set up in the middle of downtown al industrial area, downtown Dubai. But we're considered as an industrial entity, though we were a farm. But we're getting power rates that are for, uh, you know, steel companies, yet our margins are not there. So there's still... It's still uh, an early stage. It's still the beginning of an ecosystem. It is very exciting, but challenging at the same time. I mean, going back to the investment, is it a lack of investor education in this space, or is it kind of they're put off by the large check sizes that are necessary to enable something like this? Um, it, it, Omar, if I could jump in there, I'd say it's both. Yeah. Right? I think it's it's we're we're having to educate the region on the. Uh, investment thesis, the technologies available, the market sizes available, et cetera, all the fundamentals of a venture investment. But at the same time, the sizes of capital are pretty large, even for our biggest and most established institutional investors. A Beco Capital, for instance, uh, the kind of money we need, right? We had a, a 25 or $27.2 million Series A, right? Even the biggest investor can't write a couple million dollar check in a Series A here. So 
it becomes very hard due to the capital intensity of our businesses. Now, what I would say is that all of us, and I know Omar, we, we know each other well, we're all looking for to move toward a more capital light model, right? Where we finance the assets separately from the business. Now with proof and, and metrics and traction, we can start to have those discussions. And we're having those now. We announced a big project in Kuwait. And but it's taking time. We're having to trailblaze that, right? And, and I'd put Omar in the camp of pioneers that are doing this. Now, one thing I will say in, in, in criticism maybe of, of the regional capital markets is that they're too busy focusing on foreign companies. They're, they're looking into America and, and Asia saying that somehow these companies must be better. But I promise the ones that are here operating in the extreme environment and navigating the hurdles here know what we're doing, right? It's, it's a challenging environment to build a business like this. So some, some high-tech farm from San Francisco may or may not be the most successful solution in the extreme environment of our, of our region. That sounds a little bit like a dig at Salvatore. Um, Salvatore, I do invested a hundred million in four foreign companies. Why, why, why did you guys do that? Why not invest in, in a startup, agri-tech startup that's based in the region? So it was actually two local companies and two foreign companies. So, uh, so, so we're doing um, that. So we've announced $130 million in about half a dozen uh, firms uh, from the Abu Dhabi Investment Office in AgTech. And it's been uh, evenly split uh, half and half between uh, local companies as well as, um, as well as international companies. And really at the investment office, we're looking at helping any company that's either expanding into Abu Dhabi from abroad or growing within Abu Dhabi. So We've been very happy to support the, the local companies and to continue to, to work with some of the new and exciting ones as well as the more established ones and see what kind of innovation they can bring to, to Abu Dhabi. And, I and mean, I, how, I, how sorry, important- I just, I just want to correct one thing though, but it wasn't a dig at them. Their timeline, when they formed and started investing, it was just not aligned to ours. In fact, audio has been very interesting and supportive. Uh, and so I'm really impressed by what Salvatore is I'm just doing. the pod. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to yeah, create no, drama. I, I, no, but I, you can create drama. It's not them. It's the large, it's the institutional investors, even in the, the established VC funds that have not been focused on this space until post-COVID. Uh, but then also the sovereigns around the region that were investing huge amounts of capital in, in foreign, uh, foreign players in this region but that are now looking for their own homegrown champions. So it's changing, Triska, so I want to be careful not to upset anyone. But yes, early on, it was hard, right? I, I, I'm one of the old players now with you know, three and a half, four years of history. So I'm talking about what it was versus what it is today. I think today there's a ton of interest everywhere, including the region. But is this um, notion of, of bringing over the, the tech that's already been developed, is that going to help create an ecosystem, Salvatore? I mean, so what we're, we're looking at doing is to create a cohort um, and create Abu Dhabi as a hub specifically on desert and arid um, climate agriculture, and not only looking at solving the solutions in Abu Dhabi, but looking at having Abu Dhabi be that hub that can produce these globally exportable solutions, because we see now that a third of the world is desert and arid climates. And so we, the, the problems that we face with food security, with water scarcity, with food wastage, those are problems that are, are global ones. And so what we would love to do is bring in technologies from abroad, help technologies that are in Abu Dhabi to grow, and then make Abu Dhabi that hub to have, uh, to be the place where that technology goes to the rest of the world from. I mean, how long do you think that's, that's going to take? Is it, is it something that, you know, <laughs> will take vast more um, investment, more $100 million investments, or is it something that now you've kind of sowed the seeds, we're going to see more of it? Because agri-tech doesn't grow in, in its own silo. It relies a lot on other technologies, on IoT, on machine learning, on artificial intelligence. And these are areas where, you know, we're not leaders. We, we really lag behind. So how, how do you solve, solve for that? Is it, does it just require vast amounts of money? Yes, I think that it is something that we've been excited about for decades in the UAE. If we look at agriculture, new innovations in agriculture, right? So um, IoT, new sensing technologies, closed environment agriculture, those are things that are, are definitely new technologies that are, we're bringing into Abu Dhabi and we're helping to grow here. But we also have seen uh, you know, an increase in the past 15 years from 9,000 farms to 25,000 farms in Abu Dhabi alone. Now we can look at these traditional farmers, see how can we upskill them? How can we bring some of these new technologies into the pre-existing farms? You know, there was the, the vision of Sheikh Zayed, our founding father, to green the desert. And we fe really feel like 
Abu Dhabi in the UAE, you know, one of the only countries and one of the first to have a, a ministry of food security showing that we're really focused on this kind of problem. That's what we need to do. It's a long journey, but we have the vision to get it done. Thanks be to God, we have the resources to be able um, to get it done. And we're also like uh, have the, um, the strategic approach to have the government involvement, but also work with our research partners, such as UAU College of Agriculture, which does a lot of research in this area, and the private sector players like the, the guys we have here, Pure Harvest, Badia, you know, and, ma- and the larger players, and make sure that, um, that we're building a, a broader ecosystem that includes the funding, the regulatory policies, the, the, uh, the regulations for land, uh, the utility prices, the research capabilities. And once we have all of that together and we're working on coordinating that approach, then uh, I think we'll be in a good position to continue to um, to lead in the vision and to lead in the execution. How big a role do you think the government should play in all of this? And this is a question I'd like to pose to all of you. Well, yeah, so I mean, go ahead, please, Salvatore. Yeah, at, at the investment office, what we look at doing is really to our role is to promote Abu Dhabi as an investment destination to attract companies here through financial incentives, but also the non-financial incentives, and then to facilitate companies to grow here. And we facilitate that by coordinating our approach with other government entities, such as Salal, the new national wholesaler under ADQ, uh, ADAFSA, the Abu Dhabi Agriculture Food Security Authority with the research universities. And then, you know, through that approach of the government promoting, attracting, facilitating, we feel like um, we're creating a good coordination and good strategic vision that we can execute on. Yeah, I was going to say, unfortunately, unfortunately, food is a strategic sector that is protected in some way or another in every country around the world. It will always have substantial government intervention. But in this case, in our region, and I'll talk to Abu Dhabi, we're an Abu Dhabi based company. um, It's actually hugely beneficial. We need government transitory involvement to help support there's a chicken and the egg problem with scale. We all need to get to scale to be competitive, but until we get to scale, we need support in certain things to enable us to get to that scale. But I'm a huge believer in transitional support, not permanent subsidies or trade barriers, which ultimately will cause uh, negative externalities, uh, crazy prices, uh, undisciplined investments in technology and failures, um, which has happened in their case uh, proof points all over the world. But um, Abu Dhabi's been supportive and is investing heavily and focused on this, but so is it at the federal level. Post-COVID, the uh, Minister of State of Future Food Security helped to appoint a national committee on the adoption of ag tech for food security, right? I helped serve on that, but so did many others uh, in the food business to drive policy change at a federal level to support investment and competitiveness of food production in the region. And now I'm here in Saudi right now as we speak a lot of it is happening in the region, right? So we all share these problems. The the GCC is too import dependent and it wants food security, water conservation, economic diversification and sustainability. And this industry, the ag tech industries enable all of those things. They scratch a lot of itches and I think the governments get it and COVID only accelerated that awareness. Ahmad, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just to add here, the government needs to protect local farmers uh, especially at an early stage to develop this industry. For example, during uh, COVID, uh, you know, Dutch products uh, imported to the UAE, the price actually went down. That's because the government stepped in, took care of their uh, freight prices. And that's the role that we would want the government to uh, uh, play in for, uh, you know, the involvement of this industry, whether in the UAE or in Saudi Arabia. I believe in Saudi Arabia, they announced they're going to have an additional tax on certain fruits and vegetables imported. And this, this is great because now you, you're protecting local farmers and you're igniting this uh, industry. So the government does play a role as, as Kai mentioned and, and Salvatore and, and uh, we, we need them, especially at the beginning. I mean, you mentioned uh, Ahmad, earlier that you're treated like a steel company. Um, I mean, you are both an agri-tech startup, but you're also just a startup. So how difficult is it navigating both of those worlds together? Because, you know, for startups have many challenges from uh, the regulate, uh, regulations, from simple thing of opening a bank account. So I imagine life is quite difficult doubly because you're in the agri-tech, agri-tech space. 
spot on. I mean, initially, for example, we had to get two licenses, one license uh, to for, for the farm itself, and then another license to import the seeds from abroad. But what's great about the UAE, it's a very progressive, uh, uh, you know, government and uh, incredible leadership. And, you know, the, uh, the, the Office of Food Security, uh, actually they set up a, a, a series of workshops last year where one of the, one of the things that came out, the recommendations is to give ACTAC, you know, one license with all the activities that we require. So it is challenging, but it's uh, comforting to know that our voice is heard. We've got access to the decision makers in the country and uh, otherwise, Badia would have ceased to exist a long time ago. Um, are you an onshore or offshore company? Omar? We're an onshore company because okay. we're all, all Saudi. So one of the, uh, all the partners are from Saudi Arabia. But another recommendation that came out of these workshops was, um, and, and, it, and it was announced, if there's a, we want to bring in an investment from a foreign entity or foreign investor for over seven and a half million dirhams, we could actually bring them in, into the onshore. I mean, does that sky does that pose a problem at all, being an onshore versus offshore? Um, it, it does with regards to international capital markets, right? So when you're onshore in most of the region, with the exception of certain free zones, et cetera, you're in uh, Sharia law. And that is difficult for a lot of international capital to want to invest the time and comfort to, to perfect their interests. And particularly with us, we use both debt and equity as do most of our industry because it's uh, so capital intensive. And so the, you know, the easy answer is yes, it matters a lot, but it matters because of regulatory environment, international comfort with capital markets and the capital we require, the kind of capital. But what I would say is that the good thing is the region has solutions for this, right? We're in Abu Dhabi global market, the IFC, but ADGM has been fantastic. It's, you have the alignment with Abu Dhabi. It's a federal free zone in British law, right? And that's enabled us to be able to get lenders and others comfortable with the fact that their loan sits in British law and they have uh, collateral interests, right? So it's a very technical answer, but yes, I think it does matter, and particularly in our industry, given the amounts of capital that we require. Okay. Miguel, I want to bring you into this conversation. Both um, Pure Harvest and, and Badia Farms are hydroponic farms. Um, and so if I remember correctly, it's, it's uh, not the, the, the produce is not grown in soil, it's in a coconut shaving solution with the use of sensors and um, IoT uh, in a climate controlled type area. Am I right? <laughs> Sky, did I get that right or Omar? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. yes. Sorry, I'm okay. running out of power, so I have to move. I apologize. Yeah. But yes, I, I that's absolutely right. or, or it could be grown in water as well directly in water. Yeah, we, sorry, uh, well, just one clarification for everyone on the phone, but uh, we all participate in controlled environment agriculture. We all control the environment, grow indoors or not, et cetera. But the, and, but the uh, hydroponics, aquaponics, and, and aeroponics is really how we irrigate. It's only a piece of the system. So I think that the right thing, and we want everyone to start saying this, is that the industry we all participate in is controlled environment ag agriculture, CEA, Hydroponics is just how we irrigate. It's only a, su a, p a subsystem within our entire solution. Okay. Um, Miguel, do you guys stock uh, any hydroponically or aquaponically grown produce in, in Kabul? Yeah, so uh, the, the first thing is you allow me to, to go a little deep in, in some of the, the takeaways for my college. Uh, in your question about the, the government role into the the localization versus the import dependency that we have in GCC countries today. I think one of the key things that I think was highlighted from Escaña Salvatore is the, the reality of the price in terms that the technology should be affordable. Today, when you do import by sea fresh or aid fresh represent around 30, 35% of the landing cost for the product in our different in countries. However, today the technology that we have is around 25% more expensive than the traditional that we, that, that, that we bring from other countries. So as Omar, uh, Omar highlighted, I think it's very necessary to the protection to the agriculture and working at the same time in the direction that step by step, the technology solution will be much more affordable because Hydroponic is a, is a great initiative for greenhouses on many of the new tech that, that we have. 
But however, even if hydroponic today, the water consumption is around 95% less than traditional agriculture. And of course, the, the carbon emission is much more less because you made the production in the place and the forecasting and freshness can be extremely powerful. The consumption about electricity is a big concern today. And we need to go step by step in two ways. For me, is the affordability of this technology in terms of compet uh, competitiveness in price versus import. And the second thing that we need to, to keep in consideration is the different varieties that is available with this new tech. Today, for example, in the Solman portfolio that we're driving in fruit and veg, it's around 500 different varieties. When okay. we're working with the different partners and we are working and cooperate with uh, uh, poor herbs, uh, we are working with Badi, we are working with uh, uh, Khalifa, with uh, Baiwa, with Elitagro. The problem is today, the varieties that is um, at the level of the quality that the customer looking for, you can find around 70, 80, varieties. But into that, the reality is that five varieties represent 80% of the total procurement. So to do, be do, this is, sorry, Miguel, but do your customers feel comfortable, um, you know, consuming these kind of agri-tech grown products, or do they want to stick with a traditional out of the soil? Thank you for the question. The point is like, the COVID-19 consequences is like accelerate the change of the different trends in customer shopping behavior. One of them was highlighted for some of the, uh, the panelists that was the e-commerce. E-commerce is growing at 500, 600%. And I give you one example. It's two years ago, e-commerce represents less than 1% contribution in Magita Putain. Today in countries like UAE, that is mature countries with a big contribution for modern trend, represent more than 6%. Countries like Saudi represent more than 10%. Yeah. So it's something that is growing very, very well. Into that, one of the pattern and path that we can highlight is in the majority of the countries that we are present as GCC, the composition for customer in terms of demographic and psychographic factor is like millennial and say generation more than 65% of the customer portfolio. This kind of people or cohort is really very, very interesting in sustainability factor and also in health and wellness. Health and wellness category was growing at more than 150%. So my answer to you is yes, the people is looking for this local solution. Even this kind of new tech like hydroponic is one step ahead of the organic or bio. It's even better, but we need to explain better that to the customer. Traceability for the customer to understand what I need to pay for that is extremely important. We need to communicate much better in that. And not forget one factor that I want to highlight one another time. Another of the path that we find in the customer insight is like the crisis or the pandemic consequences at economic level to provoke that the customer is looking for more value for money. In this value for money, the reality of the price is extremely, extremely important. It's why we need to find this kind of partnership between government, and as you know, Majid al Futani signed one memorandum of uh, uh, agreement with the Minister of uh, Climate uh, Change and Environment in the way that we will help and we are trying to buy as maximum as possible at local level. And that is not declaration. I want to share some number with you. In 2020, the procurement that is coming at local level for um, uh, UAE in Majid al Futain represent only 10% of the total procurement in fruit and veg. Wow. In, 20, in 2019, sorry, 2020, that is already by two, it's 20%. And our aspiration, collaborate together with the startup companies at the level, the people in the farm, and with the government is to achieve in 2025 near to 50% of the procurement at local level. But for that, we need to collaborate and we must guarantee the affordability of the prices. That mm -hmm. is extremely, extremely necessary. And I think honestly, one of the best in class in my point of view is uh, what is doing, it's not because uh, Sky is here, but uh, Poor Harvest is a very, very, very good example. 
and even other people is going in this direction. But I think that is the right example that we need to follow. And for that, we open the door and we are collaborating much more for have some programs, dedicated programs according to the different varieties to buy 100% the production, but we must guarantee the competitiveness. Because in no, whatever we try to do, no will work. So in how we find short versus medium long-term solution, I think it's a key role that the government need to play with all of us. That is my, my view. Okay, thank you, Miguel. Um, on my side, do you think it is going to be price that will drive this industry? The, I think the price, to, the price yeah. quality awareness, right? There's a number of factors. And I actually wanted to address something. Uh, thank you, Miguel. When we, we consider Carrefour a great partner and an early adopter here. Um, but I would say that about cost, it really depends on what, what varieties, what products, et cetera. So Omar is pr producing some pretty, pretty special and exotic product. It's a bit higher price, but it's also a very unique quality level and something that is not available in the market. We produce a variety of things. We produce very premium ones like heirloom tomatoes sold into Waitrose. And we also produce mass market quantities and volumes in loose formats that we're extremely competitive in. But Miguel, I know from our, from, for us, right, we're anywhere from 25 to 60% cheaper than comparable quality imports, right? And we're delivering real value. In fact, we, some of our retail partners have shared information with us about what has happened to imports versus domestic production. And we thought we were an import displacement solution, but we always believed there was price elasticity in the market. What we've seen in some of our retail partners is that we, we're actually only displacing a piece of the imports. A lot of people are still buying their favorite variety of French tomato or, or um, uh, Californian strawberry. I guess we're producing strawberry. 26 varieties of tomatoes and six varieties of strawberries today. But what, what we're seeing actually is that it, uh, de imports have only declined something like 20% uh, in the categories we're serving but demand has grown 290%. There has been increased per capita consumption across most of the demographic, and then in some of it, substitution. So that's a really interesting argument for how price will drive adoption. And we need to get our cost structure down, but that's where it's a chicken or the egg problem. Is, um, is there an opportunity to go direct to consumer? And yes, no. What, that we, we do in a way, right? So and I know I'm going to let Omar comment here too, but we sell through some direct-to-consumer uh, e-commerce partners, right? They deliver fresh boxes to consumers. We do that, and I think they do too. But I would say, though, there's an element of we don't want to also compete with our customers, right? If we make Miguel's business heard, he's not going to want to adopt and support us with what is the holy grail for us, which is if Carrefour enters a multi-year commitment so that we can then secure cheap capital, guarantee our offtake and our demand and our price levels, and have a guaranteed economic model that's entirely financeable, right? So I guess what I wanted to cover is it's a chicken or the egg problem across our entire cost structure, capital structure, and demand structure. We, we need scale to get the costs down, but you need the cost down to get Miguel to sign the contract, and it's a virtuous cycle of challenge. And Omar, I want you to comment on that. You sit in a different place in the cost curve than I do, but very similar challenges. If you allow me one, one comment, this guy is like, I partially agree in you argue at the level then some of the varieties that is making the production and if you house the, the tomato that you have is out of doubt, is the top class, high level quality. And at this level of segment, in this level of quality, you are the best equation. Mm -hmm. However, I repeat, you need to keep in mind that in retailing, 5% uh, of the product or five varieties represent 80% of the procurement. And these varieties, unfortunately, habitually is the enterprises, enterprise tomato, enterprise cucumber, enterprise onion. And in that, the competitiveness that we have from other countries at European level that can happen in Morocco on some of the uh, product in, in Africa countries like Kenya is something that uh, is pretty hard, pretty, pretty hard. That is then the point that I try to say and we I see, Miguel. Go. Sorry, but if and, I can comment on and that. And even, it's, it's, Sky, you allow me to finish my year only one minute. It's like the point that I totally agree with you. It's like now in the industry, we have something that is extremely powerful, that is the advanced analytics. How we can interpret it and checking what you say according to the different factor, the basket and the frequency for the different customer segment, what the mission is, what the substitution happened that you mentioned, is a key part of this analytical part. And even if you allow me the last point, 
the potential to improve the efficiencies in terms of economy of scale is extremely big. I give you one data than even uh, Omar and you, scale you know better than me. Is the fragmentation in the uh, agriculture in GCC countries. UAE have more than 29,000 farms. Dan is driving for 20,000, uh, 26,000 farmers. That is data 2020. So we need to create, like you did in Poor Harvest, Dan Tagro is doing some conglomerate. Then we need to transform the traditional agriculture in the new way to do, like China did 15 years ago. That, that Miguel, thing that is that I try to highlight. Is it fair to put it all on, onto the startups that we need to transform all of this? That Absolutely. Requires... Absolutely. And we have a wonderful example, like how Sardia in the middle of the desert is making production from rice. That is one of the beginning things. But what you did, both of you, Omar and, and Sky, with your companies, like I, I want to be clear that Buddy was one pioneer in that. How many years ago you start this business? But to make that then will be uh, suitable is the key point here because for me I want to be clear the point of view of the retailers today is as much we have localization better better in terms of procurement better in terms of forecasting better in terms of freshness so it's more profitable for all of us so if I find some product then the local production is competitive I will go like crazy because we're looking the same and even the acceptance from the customer over this new vertical solution is amazing. It's very, very so, powerful. Sorry to cut you off, Miguel. Omar, I mean, Miguel is pretty much saying it's up to you guys to make it competitive and, and make it cheap. He'll be all over it. He'll buy all your products. For sure. There's a few points to make here. Thank you, Miguel, and, and, and thank you, Sky. So one, I think Carrefour are doing a great job in educating the customer. They've set up these containers and uh, mini containers or mini vertical farms at their stores. And it's again, to showcase what is this technology, get consumers comfortable with it uh, and, and to give the, uh, provide the aspect of sustainability. But at, the, at that angle, they're doing, they're doing a great job. Now, in terms of, it, it all goes down obviously to the cost. Now, for us, uh, for example, Badia Farms, when we started and we are today, we've been working on reducing the cost, but it's all by enhancing our processes, optimizing the technology, uh, you know, using different uh, uh, climate controls. But uh, Miguel, until like the government comes in and steps in and gives me a reduced power rate or reduced the rental rate, there isn't much I can do. I mean, a big, I'll, tell, I'll be honest, a big portion of our cost of the product is basically power. Power is huge. I mean, we're paying 40 fills per kilowatt. If this goes down to four, eight, or 10, bang, we have we have a deal for sure. But so, this, this, sorry, but this, a bit and then Salvatore will go to you. Yeah, but, but that's, but that's, but, but you know, we, we understand that. And it's not like we, we're charging high margins. We are uh, 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 fighting for survival. And, and, and so I can tell you what we've, we've been going through just to stay afloat, Miguel. Uh, but again, the the buyers I mean, need to understand that uh, if it's a matter of a dirham or a dirham and a half, they, they're they're playing a big role in when they purchase that product from a local producer, especially today. Uh, and as and as Kai said, and I mean the cost they're going to give you now is completely different from what I give you three four years down the line when they have multiple facilities, multiple hectares across the UAE. And and lastly, just the point to make. Now, um, uh, you know, the rest of the globe, the GCC market is huge for them. You know, they export a lot. So uh, they're not going to let go easily of this market. So if, if Badia or Pure Harvest gift price X, guess what? Overnight, they're going to bring in 20% less. And that's, again, we need to be aware of that if we're serious and committed about building this industry here in the region. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's Salvatore. He hasn't said anything for a while. Yet, I mean, so I think the point that Omar was just raising is exactly what we're looking to do at the at Abu Dhabi Investment Office. So the way that we're supporting companies financially is through a rebate incentive scheme. And what we do there is we look cost center by cost center and we look, look at what we can cover and we give uh, rebate deals where we will cover a percentage of key cost centers, specifically innovation. But ones. is that so, 
Yeah, so what we're looking at doing, especially is focusing on R&D. So as Sky was saying, there's a lot of upfront CapEx costs in a lot of these, these companies. They are There's less than 1% of loans in the UAE that are given to agricultural companies. It's really difficult for them to do that that uh, upfront cost to do that upfront R&D to bring in these innov innovative solutions. So what we're looking at isn't to fund BA or business as usual. What we're looking at is how can we help companies to you know, get that uh, the foot off the ground, have that initial investment in R&D in their CapEx, uh, you know, lower those initial cost competitiveness areas like land, like utilities, and then uh, God willing, these companies will be able to produce those um, that produce for the market, produce that technology for the market, as well as to be exported globally. And, uh, you know, hopefully this boost is able to, to put the companies in a good position to compete. Sky, you're um, in the UAE, Saudi and Kuwait now. What is the experience like in each of these countries? How do they differ? Which is, which is the more favorable one for you? Actually, great, um, great segue to a comment I wanted to make in response to Miguel's comments on, on, on the 95 versus 5% argument. We're finding, for instance, in, we announced a huge project in Kuwait in partnership with the Sultan Center, the largest private retailer in Kuwait and a public company. What made this possible and why we built, we're building a farm in Kuwait bigger than all three of our farms combined in the UAE. Why is that? Because we had a retailer who engaged with us to share their data. They wanted us to produce, Miguel, their, their commodity varieties, their kind of bigger volume, lower value, and their premium into the market. So and we can do that, and we can do that very competitively. But we need the scale um, to be able to justify building that farm. So we need the offtake. We need the commitment from the retailer that I will buy it. If you build me a giant cucumber monocropped farm, I will buy everything you produce. Then we can justify the lower gross margins on the, the commodity varieties and, and it works, the model. Why are we all focused on the high end of the market right now? Because it's the only thing that makes economic sense to do with no security of offtake, period. And so that's why we're in your 5% of your market. But I wanna mention how is it differing? Kuwait embraced us and we're building an, a north of 80,000 square meter initial facility producing multiple crops and it's a farm center. We have an edutainment area, a cafe and a retail center all in one with farms, right? That we wanna do that everywhere. And we're looking to do that in, in Saudi. We're here discussing a very large scale farm in partnership with pieces of a semi-governmental a, a partner that's not yet public. But we are building around the region. What we need though, and I'm talking about our home market, the UAE, we do need the retailers. We need them to come to the table and say, we've seen what you can do. What else can you do? And then work in a collaborative way. And we're seeing that around the region. Now, I'm not saying they're not doing that, by the way, those discussions have begun but it's been harder in our home market than it has been in other markets. And I think there's just been an aversion because of a long history of ag being unprofitable. And there's even the fear of what I call origin-based quality, right? People literally say like France better, UA worse. Not true anymore, right? But consumers are changing. So it's, it, it's everyone, it's the consumers, the government, the retailers, it's us, right? And we, it's a virtuous cycle, but the great thing is it's picking up traction everywhere. Consumers care. They now have trust and they've tried the quality of our products and of Omar's. Um, governments are backing us. Thank you, Salvatore and everybody else who's getting involved. And now uh, the retailers are coming to the table, but admittedly, Miguel, you know, I'll sign the same deal with you yesterday that I did with TSC if you're available to do it. It's something we're really keen to be doing. And we can build a 10 hectare dedicated farm, including commodity varieties of cucumber, tomato, and all your mass market products profitable. Um, so Sky, thank you very much. I tell you, you challenge with passion. We will do something, something very powerful. And I want to, you know, then we contact with, uh, with you. The last week we was in, in contact with you, with your team. We was two weeks, uh, two weeks ago, uh, or one week ago with, uh, with Omar visit the, the farms. So the point, guys, is like into the area of responsibility that I have in Majid al Futain as responsible of the, um, the merchandise. One of the key things is to play the economy of scale and in our way to purchase, I want to be very transparent with you. Priority one is countries in two countries. Priority two is GCC countries. Priority three is when I don't find the source in GCC, we try to other Middle East countries then we source the other math countries. When this not happen, I go to looking for export. But into that, I open the door we start from the next um, year, 2021, to develop our own private level in fruit and vegetable. Private level, 
I want to be extremely clear for you. In consumer good today, 90% of the procurement is happening in GCC countries. 90%. Out of our countries is coming only 10%. In fruit and veg, we have a wonderful opportunity and I extremely open to explore in very transparent way some joint ventures to have some programs that we uh, uh, can do something very powerful in the terms of competitiveness is the good one. But our determination keep in mind and that is signed in one clear document between Majid al and government in UAE is that in 2025, we won't achieve 50% of the procurement versus the 20% that is happened today. So we need to. Like, I, I feel like happen, we're, we're in go. the middle of a, a contract negotiation almost, and I'm, I'm mindful of the time. We only have 10 minutes left. So um, if we could just, if I can ask each one of you where you think the sector is headed, and clearly there needs to be a lot more cooperation between all the different aspects. I mean, that's the main thing that I've, I've just picked up from listening to you guys. Salvatore, where? Yeah, I was going to say that I would say that it seems like from the conversation that there is that cooperation, right? Like the fact that we all know each other and have talked, uh, you know, to, to each other, you know, recently um, and are, are in these discussions shows that uh, that it is happening. And of course, we need more of that. But I think from from the government point of view, we're here to listen and we're here to support. We've made a lot of policy changes in the last year only that support uh, agriculture. We have you know, launched the Audio's ag tech um, incentive program and we have brought, uh, spent you know, 130 million on half a dozen companies bringing uh, them into Abu Dhabi or helping them expand uh, and grow in Abu Dhabi. And so I think it's about that coordination also on a government level. We are working really closely with all the other agriculture focused government entities to make sure that we are aligned on policy, on regulation, on the strategies, on the companies that we're working with. And so um, I actually love this panel uh, because it shows how much we we do listen to one another and we do work together and uh, definitely need more of that but I think it's something we should just continue to do and there's always going to be new challenges agriculture is incredibly complex like Sky was saying it's not just hydroponics that's one of the you know hundreds of inputs into it but it's also a really collaborative um, sector as well we have 23,000 uh, farms in the UAE that even the world's largest indoor farm can't supply one Carrefour alone, right? We're going to need thousands of closed environment agriculture producers as well. And so um, the sector is about collaboration. The government is here to do that coordination from the public sector view, bring in the private sector where we can. And then God willing, the private sector also does that, that talking and we can create those, those uh, you know, formats for them. But uh, I'm very optimistic for the sector and, and I'm honored to be part of like pushing the vision that our, our government and our leadership has. Omar, Omar, how optimistic are you and what do you think needs to happen in order to enable companies like yours to thrive? Look, it's, uh, it, it's very exciting what's ha happening uh, in, this, uh, in this sector. It's just because now we've got through, because of technology and advancements in plant science, we've got ways now to grow in, in the middle of the desert. Uh, 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 it, it just would need it, it will need uh, more of these discussions, more collaborations, all the different stakeholders to come in together to again revive, ignite, create something that does not exist. Uh, you know, for example, with buyers, if once they're comfortable with with the price, with the quality, uh, with the ability to uh, supply all year round, then giving these contracts would actually facilitate the loans, facilitate the investors. So. You know, it's a lot of different parts coming together. The government has begun and there's much bigger role to do. Uh, so uh, we'll, 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 we'll look forward to that, uh, Salvatore. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's very exciting. I'm very optimistic uh, and, uh, you know, happy to be, be changing the agriculture landscape of this region. Okay. Sky, I'm going to ask you a question that someone has, has posted in. Um, Mo Al Salafi says, it seems that most agri-tech companies here are scale-ups. Do you see the future of agri-tech in the region consolidating into oligarchy, big exits, or government initiatives? If yes, do you think this could impede startup incentives or initiatives? Very good question. Um, and also, I'll hopefully answer that other question. I have some thoughts on it. But all production industries, in my experience, and I spent my life as a technology investor before I became an entrepreneur, end up in kind of uh, oligopolies with, with kind of a bunch of fractional players in the remainder of the market. 
who, why does that happen? There's a long discussion on microeconomics of why, but essentially uh, the large players in the industry define the minimum efficient scale to be competitive in a production industry driven by scale economies. So eventually, yes, consolidation will happen and it has happened in every market. I can point to the seven controlled environment ag players in the American market that dominate 80% of the supply, right? So yes, it is a manufacturing business where scale begets scale and we will, it will happen, but it will take time. And to the second question on the government intervention, yes, the wrong kind of government invention is, it worries me. It's one of the things that keeps me up at night. If the government starts to compete in this sector, that is not good. It will scare away uh, international capital. And we need a lot more capital than even the governments here can provide if we want 50% domestic supply. So I caution the government, and I've said this openly in my roles in advising governments in this space, to do the right kind of support, not the wrong kind, and to become to form national champions that compete and crowd out uh, private sector investment in the space will not benefit consumers long term, and it will scare the crap out of international capital who wants to who wants to come compete with the sovereign who's backed a giant in the industry. And actually, in the past, there have been sovereign investments in various spaces where that happened, and the crowd out effect was so dramatic. There's only one player left, and it's the government player who is inefficient. And so. I actually, I, that is a worry of mine and I hope it doesn't happen. But yes, on the other side, I think eventually, you know, five to, to 10 larger players will dominate in every market around the region. And I think that's a good thing that has been proven to be an equilibrium that leads to very high quality and very good prices in a vibrant market. But it takes a lot of time. Miguel, do you think that someone like Carpool will become a player as well and start having its own vertical farms and its supermarkets? Or is it is the right way to partner with the likes of uh, Badia Farms and, and Pure Harvest? No, it's, uh, my, my, my view is like I totally align with, uh, with this guy. I think the, uh, the competitiveness is always the best way. So I think in, in short term, we need some kind of support but uh, I think it's the best player that like, is happening in the industry. And I continue to say like poor herbs, like uh, Elitagro, like some different people with different in initiative that is coming to date. And for example, it's extremely in interesting. Khalifa farm with different kind of tech that is coming to in very strong way. Uh, I think that is a health way to do. We need to the good competition, health competition with better communication and more trust, then I think that will happen between the different stakeholders because to the end of the day, we need this kind of solution for multiple factors. And of course, like I think Sky and Omar before to highlight too, is like the what is happening at world -well level that you very well structure to the beginning of the presentation at the level of the resources the sustainability, the rational consumerism. We need to be together in that. So my point is, and my vision, and the determination for my digital food time is that that become a reality. I mm -hmm. told you the numbers, and I even I say, we was the pioneers in hypermarket to have vertical farm into the store. Already we have five. We can 10 more in 2021. And this, we no stop we will find the solution together. I think it's necessary. And uh, I open my hand for you guys. Really, we need you. We want to grow together more. That's a lovely sentiment to end on. Um, I'm afraid we've run out. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and thanks everyone for participating uh, or attending rather.